I'm Elliot Higgins. I'm the founder of Bellingcat, and these are five investigation tools that you can use today. The first tool I would recommend is one that is called Firms, which is a NASA tool that is actually a map you can search of fires from across the globe. So what you have it are satellites that are picking up heat signatures, and these heat signatures are then reported on the Firms map. And the Firms map is accessible by anyone. You can search by dates, you can look at the last 24 hours. But when there's things like wildfires, you can actually see where these fires are happening. So we've had the recent LA fires. Um, we've had, for example, massive fires in places like Turkey and Greece, and you can actually see where those fires are happening in near real time. So in our investigative work, that's really useful, not just for investigating forest fires, but we can also look at allegations of, you know, there's a claim that an arms depot in Ukraine has been blown up. You can actually see the heat signatures from that on this system. So it's a very useful tool for a range of investigations. It can be very useful, like if you're living in somewhere where you know there's wildfires, how close is that to your property? You can examine that. You can actually see the movement of these fires over time as well. There is an interesting one which you've shared, which is called EPIOS. The EPIOS system, EPIOS, is a really useful system for looking at lots of publicly available data in one place. Um, some of this can be the kind of public data that isn't always easy to find in one place. So if you've got a phone number, an email, you can actually use that to search for related social media accounts, for example, or email accounts that are related to the same person. So if you get a bit of information about someone, you can pull it in there and it's basically a search engine for all the info information that might be available about them online. And that can be hugely, hugely valuable for investigations. If you want to creep yourself out, you can look yourself up as well and see what kind of information that people can find out about you. I think it's always worth doing as well because it's a good reminder that whilst you think, you know, oh, I've registered here on this website and I've done it over here on this website, but I've used a different email or, you know, I I've changed something up. Actually, that stuff can still be linked together. So it's really, really worth having a look there to see actually how connected your information is on the internet because you might not realize how much is public about you. That is quite scary. How hard is it actually to raise your digital footprint? If you've spent a lot of time on the internet over the years, you will find it very, very hard to remove information about yourself because even if you delete online accounts, you will have, for example, data breaches where your email address, your passwords could be part of a data breach somewhere. That is why it's important not to use the same password on multiple websites. That's why it can be useful to have more than one email address with very different, uh, a very different name so people can't so easily link different accounts together. I, for example, have different types of email accounts for the different kinds of websites that I'm registering to. So I keep my kind of uh, supermarket account separate from you know my banking account. So if information is leaked from one, it can't have an impact from the other. Unless someone has spent really very little time on the internet, it's very hard not to have some form of digital uh, footprint online. Now, there are people who are very just private. They don't post much online, so they're fine. But even relatively obscure people can leave a digital footprint that they might have no idea could be discovered in the long term. So we had uh, an online investigation once that was about someone who'd been sending harassing messages to a young woman, but he had been using a online handle for that harassment that we could actually discover... Uh, was linked to YouTube accounts because we could use this system to look at that online handle. When we found his YouTube account, he had been streaming videos from games he was playing. And the name of his character in those videos was different from the name he was using online. And that was then linked to Facebook accounts that were then linked to the real person. So we do the flight radar. Can you tell us more about it? So you have uh, websites like Flight Radar 24 that allow you to track flight traffic. Um, Lots of people probably already use that because you can track the commercial flights, see when your family members are going to land at the airport if flights have been delayed. It's a useful tool for that. But investigations, you can also use it for other things as well. When we're looking at the movements of individuals, um, for example, if they post on Instagram, uh, they're getting on a plane somewhere and that plane's got a, you can see the tail number, for example, you can figure out where that flight went to, even if they don't tell you explicitly. You can use it to verify that someone must have been in a certain location or could have reached a certain location in a certain period of time. Um, you know, prove that the evidence they're providing through their social media accounts of what they're doing and what they're do trying to uh, 
show the public is actually accurate because sometimes you do have people who claim to be in one place and are actually in another. We have the example of the guy who was tracking Elon Musk's um, private jet flights, which resulted in Elon Musk shutting his uh, t Twitter account down. So you can you will have commercial aircraft, cargo flights, uh, small private aircraft as well. There was an investigation where I was tracking one uh, notorious UK political leader using the private um, flights he was taking from small airports because he had a little private plane he was taking from place to place and they were always small airports so it made it easy to track him. There might be negotiations that are going on between countries so you can sometimes see uh, you know a Russian aircraft that you know is used by the president flying to somewhere like you know Saudi Arabia and then you see maybe a plane from Ukraine that's used by the government flying there and you think oh actually maybe this is something that is actually you know newsworthy it could be a start of a peace related meeting so you can sometimes get it to, in a kind of newsy sense to get a advantage on your competitors by watching this stuff carefully you could also um, when there's been air disasters actually use it to track the final moments of aircraft so when we were looking at the shooting down of ps752 uh, in iran um, that was claimed to have been shot down by an air defense missile system and there's a video that was published online that um, showed it was filmed at night and it showed a light in the sky, which was the aircraft, and then a light shooting towards it, and then a flash, and a few seconds later, the sound of the, the an explosion. Now, we didn't know if that was real or not, so what we did is we geolocated the video, and we could show that it was filmed in a direction pointing towards the flight path of the aircraft, because that flight path was actually on uh, flight ra radar 24 and then we could actually show that the amount of time it took the between the flash and the noise we could show that to actually measure the distance that moment when there was confusion about exactly what happened and claims and counterclaims that was the first solid evidence we had saying yes this was a missile strike on the aircraft so marinetraffic.com is a website that allows you to track marine traffic vessels have a signaling device that can be picked up by satellites and other receivers. That is then streamed live on the internet. And you can see thousands and thousands of vessels from across the entire world in real time. In the work of Ballincat, we've been using that for a very, Various things that has included tracking the smuggling of grain, arms transfers, uh, the blocking of various uh, transport routes, the Suez Canal, for example. But all of this information is publicly available in real time for you to take a look at. With the tracking of vessels, what happens sometimes is those transponders that are used to show their position are turned off. But what we're able to do is combine that tracking along with satellite imagery of locations. You can actually see these vessels on satellite imagery even after the transponders turned off. So if you have a rough idea which way they were going, you can spot them. Most recently, we've done that in an investigation into an oil spill off the coast of Trinidad and Tobago, where members of our Discord server first identified where the ship could be using marine traffic websites, and then we were able to help them with satellite imagery we could provide to show them the route when the transponder was turned off. How do you think regular people could use that? Well, the marine traffic stuff can be quite interesting when there's um, weather events, for example, mm -hmm. um, seeing if routes are blocked. If you're someone who takes a lot of uh, ferries, uh, like I occasionally do, it's very useful to see if there's any held up traffic. You can also see the shipping vessels that get trapped behind you know, the, the large uh, blockages that the Suez Canal has occasionally and wonder where your, you know, where your PlayStation 5 is. It's probably on the back of one of those vessels. So why do we have to have this public data? This information is used by commercial companies, for example, for tracking the routes of various vessels. Um, it can also be used by people who are tracking things like sanctions to see where various vessels are. One of the things we could do in our early investigation into the Trinidad and Tobago oil spill is actually track the vessel responsible and that actually results in that vessel being seized by the authorities because of, of its involvement in oil spill. Wow. And the, the other one which you had was the, yeah, the Bellingcat toolkit and GitHub. So Bellingcat is a lot of tool development. So we have a GitHub account. So GitHub is basically a place you can go where people who are programmers can share their code. Other people then can take and adapt that code. So what we try to do is we encourage tool development for various types of tasks. And they can be very specific tasks, but that's then maintained by the community. So to help people discover those tools, we have the Bellingcat toolkit. So 
that's a website you can go to where we have created a database of various tools we use in open source investigation. And it has a search engine that's um, powered by AI. So if you type in, how do I do this type of investigation, it will actually tell you which tools in the database can be used in those investigations and how to use those tools. So it's really about making it a lot easier for people to, to discover the tools they need mm -hmm. to do investigations, but also create a space for them to develop their own tools or adapt the tools they discover that other people have made for their own purposes. I want to ask you about AI. How do you, do you use AI in your work? And, and if so, how, how do you do that? AI is um, an interesting one for us. I think a lot of the focus with AI has often been on uh, less than useful tasks for open source investigation. But as these systems have developed over time, um, they are getting better and better. Sometimes it can be very useful. For example, if you have a piece of paper that's uh, got something written on it in scrappy handwriting in a language you don't understand, it can be a lot more effective to put it through something like ChatGPT 4.0 then trying to get it translated, you know, find the right person to do that. But it's a really useful research tool when you're dealing with these kind of new ideas and concepts to, you know, see what other work's been done so far, what other approaches have there been to these topics and these issues. I wanted to ask about, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's not strictly related to this. It just came to me as we were talking and I'm interested in it. Wikileaks. Can, can we have another Wikileaks or we kind of pass that? I think the thing with Wikileaks is that it's like, okay, you've got this information. What do you do with that information? Mm -hmm. That's what is interesting to me. With Bellingcat, it's always been about enabling other people to do the work of, that Bellingcat does. Because mm -hmm. for me, it's about, it's a methodology that I think is really, really valuable in a range of different ways. It's also very empowering. I think with WikiLeaks though, that was more about getting information out there so other people would then do something with that information. Mm -hmm. You know, that came through kind of more traditional partnerships with media organizations like they did with The Guardian, for example, when I think that is more reflected of how media, how the kind of information model was in the 2000s rather than how it is now, which I think has changed significantly. And that creates opportunities. There are other organizations now like DDoS Secrets that still publish leaked data. But I think what we need are organizations, networks who can actually take that data and use it. Mm. Um, even for me, there was a DDoS Secrets actually got the emails of the lawyers who represented Jeff Genny Prigozhin when he sued me. And I didn't realize that until some other journalists came across that by chance that they were talking about me in these emails. And it was actually quite useful information for my court case. <laughs> it was a kind of missed opportunity for WikiLeaks, I think, mm -hmm. that they didn't evolve. But then I think they had other issues that they were dealing with.